God set the Lamb in the midst of the throne. Yes, that's right. And all, everything around the throne, actually, if you see it clearly, it points to the Son. So it makes it more clear and clarifies right. the Lamb's work, which is to do God's will. That's right. Mm -hmm. And if anything happens that is potentially distracted in heaven, these heavenly creatures start to sing in praise, that's right. point, pointing Amen. to God and Christ. See? Yeah. That's how it is to be with us. Yes. When something happens, it's a, it's a benefit. It's a blessing. It's a benefit. No question about that. But you get get the, get the praise cranked up, yeah. so that we know where this came from. Yeah. We don't forget where it came from. We don't get to thinking that we're the ones that did it. Yeah. Or finally, this stuff is happening because we got together. Oh, this came from God. Finally, we got where God wanted us. All points to him. What's central? A salvation that does not eventually produce insight into the person of Christ is really not salvation at all. It's not. Now, brethren, I know people that have been saved 10, 15, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years and they hardly know anything about Christ. I'm saying that's not salvation. They may be nice people. Of course, they may not be, too. I'm not sure how nice a person can be that doesn't know Christ. I'm not sure that, that you can establish that in the first place. I, this is serious. I understand what I'm saying it has serious implications. But I've been compelled to take this view because when I discovered myself in that condition, I knew I can't stay here. I got to get out of this situation where I'm fundamentally ignorant about Christ. Because there is no such thing as a salvation that leaves you perpetually ignorant of Christ and what Christ brings you through God. All right, so he's established the centrality of Christ all through these first seven verses. He keeps taking you back to what God did through Christ, by Christ, in Christ, in whom, so forth. Now he talks about something we have. Now it's something we ought to have. Something we have. Now something we can have. Something we have. We possess. Other versions use the word gain. We gain. The idea we, we appropriated it. The word have, as used in this text, I'll give you the technical meaning of it. To have, to hold, to, to have or hold in the hand, in the sense of hearing, to have possession of the word, to hold fast or to keep, to have or comprise or involve. In other words, it's in your, it's in your possession. Right. You've, you've got it. It's not, redemption isn't something we are looking at. It's something we possess. Amen. We have redemption. This is not a declaration of what's possible, what is possible to have, but something we do have in Christ. Well, the concept of redemption, we ought to say something about it. What does redemption like mean? It's not a common word today. Redemption. Some of the older songs they talked about, I'm redeemed by love divine, glory, glory, Christ is mine. See, there's a, the redemption. What is redemption? Well, the word involves a, a purchase of something that once belonged to you, but it was devoted to another purpose, and you, you purchased it back. You freed it. 
really belonged to you, but it was in use by somebody else. Redeemed it back. Now the word redeem is mentioned several times in the Old Testament scriptures. God himself is called Redeemer in several Old Covenant scriptures. Job said, I know my Redeemer lives. That was, that was some insight, wasn't it, for his time? So frequently he's referred to as Redeemer. God himself frequently referred to himself as Redeemer and redeemed. At that time, when Jesus was born, at that time, it is said that the angel revealed to Zechariah that he had come to redeem his people. He hath redeemed his people. He has connected with that. When he was born, there were some people in Jerusalem waiting for redemption. God had promised, I'm going to redeem, I'm going to, I'm going to take this people back. But when God takes somebody back, it's got to be legal in the courts of heaven. That's right. It has to be right. He just can't put your arm around you and say, well, everything's forgiven, welcome home. It's not quite like that. <laughs> I understand the parable of the prodigal. There's a lot involved in being received back home. A lot involved. Redemption. Jesus has been made unto us. First Corinthians one thirty says he's been made to us redemption. Mm -hmm. So you, if you've got Jesus, you've got redemption. Amen. Jesus is made to you. Mm -hmm. So redemption is a person, possession of person Christ. So if a person not sure whether they have Christ, or, then they can't be sure that they have redemption or that they've been redeemed. It's in a person. Paul wrote that Jesus gave himself to redeem us from all iniquity. Well, was it successful? You would never think so if you looked at you looked at the modern church. You'd never think he'd actually have it. That's what he he gave himself to redeem us from all iniquity. And Peter said to redeem us to God. So you're from redeemed from something to something. You've taken away from one thing and given to God. Redeemed from. So a person who's still serving iniquity is not redeemed from iniquity. And a person who's not living unto God is not redeemed unto God. Now, I don't know how else you could arrive at any other conclusion. Paul wrote of the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. So it's like a, it's a whole body of things. The redemption consists of a whole body of things. Debts are paid. People are set free. Legal claims on you by someone else are voided. You're not imprisoned any longer. You're free to come to God. It's offered as you desire. There's a lot wrapped up in this redemption. Word redemption isn't being used a lot because <laughs> it's not found a lot in the people. That's right. That um, it, you would actually get the, the more of the uh, the observation would be that God's just pretending that they're saved. Yeah. Because He overlooks the sin. Yeah. This is what's being taught. And they call that love yeah. too. And He's overlooking it, but see, this word redemption doesn't fit in that economy. That's right. Redemption. Uh -huh. The redemption is paid to God. He's the one, he's the one that is, gets the payment. He made the payment and he made it to himself. Jesus is said to have obtained eternal redemption for us. Hebrews 9, 12. So this is not meant to be a seasonal thing or on and off. He obtained eternal redemption and we were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. So this is a pay, payment was made with a life because mm -hmm. the life of the flesh is in the blood. So for you to be free, somebody had to die. Uh -huh. For your sins to be covered, somebody had to die uh -huh. because of your sin. Yeah. 
It could not just be erased. It wasn't that way. You had to be redeemed. You know, under the law, a firstborn animal belonged to God. But there are some animals God wouldn't accept. An ass was one of them. I understand it's a crossbreed. He wouldn't accept it. So the man had to keep it, use it, but before he could use it, he had to redeem it. Because <laughs> it did belong to God, yeah. but God didn't accept it, so the man had to redeem it with a lamb yeah. before he could use it. God had to redeem you mm -hmm. before he could use you. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> I've heard people say if God could use a donkey, he could use a man. Well, that sounds really nice. Yeah. But even if he used a donkey, it had to be redeemed. Mm -hmm. Amen. That's right. Isn't that the truth? Amen. That donkey Jesus rode on when in Jerusalem, I have no question, had been redeemed. Mm -hmm. If the man was living by the law, he'd redeem that donkey for personal use. He couldn't. He said, if you don't, you got to kill it. Mm -hmm. If I can't have it, nobody can have it. And before I'll allow you to use what belongs to me, you have to pay for it. With a life, life for life, redeemed. See, all this is back under the law. He opened up this matter of redemption, what's involved in it. Redemption denotes, it's kind of a summary word, denoting our recovery from sin. It's a summary word that, that uh, involved, is involved in that. That a price had to be paid before you could recover. You could confess Christ and be baptized over and over till the Jesus comes. And if there had not been a redemption, it would all have been for naught. Yeah. It had to be preceded by redemption. You, you had to be purchased mm -hmm. by God before God would receive you. And we were redeemed from the curse of the law. Galatians 3.13 says. So if God didn't purchase you out of that condition... See, the law wouldn't let you go. The law said, this man has sinned. This man has sinned. I can't let him go. I'm not lying when I condemn this man, this woman, this child. He sinned. God said, all right, I'll pay the debt with the life of my son. And when he did, the law let us go. <laughs> Cleopas and his friends said to the Lord, to the Master, the night of the resurrection, we had hoped that it was he who would redeem Indeed. Israel. That's right. Mm -hmm. They knew. They, they didn't picked understand up. all the implications. They hadn't connected the dots, so to yeah. speak. So he had to admonish them so of heart to believe all that was Yeah. He, they it had, had happened. They just didn't know it yet. That's right. Uh -huh. They picked uh -huh. up on this, see? Yeah. Uh -huh. See, that, the word that, that's forfeited if you don't have a Bible reading society. And everybody in the world knows the church is not Bible reading. Mm -hmm. There isn't a minister on a globe that doesn't know this is the case. They used to put signs, I have all thought the time, how, how many read their Bible this week? If there's 200 people, it'd be like 10 or 15 would have read the Bible. And that was a generation ago. Yeah, yeah, they don't have that up now. <laughs> Well, that used to be up on the bill, but had a board up there, and how many read their Bibles? They knew that today's church is not a Bible reading church. The average Christian is not a Bible reading person. Cleopas and his partner were. That's, right. That's why they knew about these. That's why they knew about these things. And if they did, when they went to church, they read the Bible. Mm -hmm. Synagogue, they read the Bible. They read the scriptures, so they were acquainted. With this, redeemed from the curse of the law, and we've been redeemed from a vain manner of life. Our vain conversation, Peter called it, pointless religious life. Talking about religious life, pointless religious life that really didn't do anything. It really didn't strengthen you. It didn't. It didn't change you. It didn't edify you. It didn't make you more like Christ. It didn't make you hate the world. It didn't make you love the law. See, it was a vain kind of a pursuit. 
but you had to be purchased out of that. Yeah. It's just, you just couldn't just like walk out. You were redeemed from a vain manner of life, which means now you can just leave it. Yes. You can just walk out. Mm -hmm. Now there's no cells with doors on them. You can just, I come to announce and preach liberty to the captives. Amen. Just come on out. Amen. Why? Redemption. Mm -hmm. That's why they could come out. Redemption. We have <coughs> redemption. This has particularly regard to the effects <coughs> of redemption that's in Christ Jesus. When it says we have re redemption, it doesn't mean like you have a wallet. It means you have a wallet with money in it. <laughs> would be a proper analogy. It wouldn't be I have a plate. It'd be I have a plate with food on it. So that we have redemption is speaking particularly about what redemption does. Frees you from the law. Frees you from the curse. Frees you from a vain conversation. Redeems you to God. So you, you possess the effects of of redemption. Otherwise, you don't have redemption. I mean, this shouldn't be difficult to uh, to receive with possess possessing redemption. But unless you know this, Satan can make inroads. He can bludgeon your conscience. Say, look, look what you were. How could God make anything out of you after what you were? It's a wonder you got in at all. He can bludgeon a person if they don't know they have redemption. Satan will beat them up about this. They'll have a defiled conscience. They'll be afraid when they don't need to be afraid. They'll hunker down in a corner of the cell when they could just get up and walk out. But the only reason is they don't realize they have redemption. So we gladly announce you have redemption. So if there's something you've been resting with, just get up and leave. It's, it's that simple. Or let's state it another way. Come unto me. Because when you get up to leave, you're leaving to go to him. Come. Jesus, is out. Jesus isn't in the cell. He's outside. Come unto me. See this? When you know you have redemption, you just, you just get up and come. You may be blind, but you get to Jesus anyway. Just like Bartimaeus did. The most important effect found in God's view of Jesus' vicarious death is that it, it, it makes the person who receives it acceptable to God. That's, the, that's important. Like, do you know that God has, has received you? Jesus doesn't think we believe that God receives us. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about having the assurance that you've been accepted in the beloved. You've been made accepted. You know it. You say, well, it's hard to come to that. Well, you got to see this we have redemption yeah, fact. Right. Once you see we have redemption, it makes it easier then to conclude yes. that God has received us. Christ has received us to the glory of God. We're accepted. See, faith has to hear a word because faith comes by hearing. So for faith to take hold of this, it's got to hear it. Amen. Not just once. Mm -hmm. See, sometimes when you hear God's word there, and you go without hearing a certain thing for a while, mm -hmm. other things like drowning out. Mm -hmm. Yes, Sister Bailey. When, um, a second ago when you were talking about Jesus calling us, um, I was reminded of Lazarus. Jesus called him. He didn't go inside the tomb. Yes. <laughs> Amen. Yeah. Amen. Very good. Yeah. <laughs> <come out>. Amen. <laughs> yeah, you've heard probably somebody say, well, no one should hear the gospel twice. So yeah, I know what I've heard it. Yeah. yeah, but the, 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 the flaw in that is that Jesus told Peter, feed my sheep. Yeah. He didn't say, go feed the world now. Even yeah. though technically he gave him the great commission and yet he said feed my sheep that's right Paul says I'm ready to preach the gospel to you there in Rome that's right. again uh -huh. again they heard it once already probably a lot more than once in fact I'll go so far as to say faith doesn't come by hearing about the fruit of the spirit mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
It's not what produces faith. Right. Faith isn't produced by hearing, be holy, for I am holy. That's not what produces faith. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ That's right. is the idea. That when you hear this gospel of Christ, yes. that message is the message that induces faith. Amen. It's not just read the Bible and you'll have faith. It's not what, that's not what Hebrews 10 is talking about. Faith comes by hearing. Mm -hmm. He told you the gospel. Bless us, feet those that bring the gospel of glad tidings, the good news, good things. That's the, that's the message that brings faith. Amen. Please, you've got to hear this, and it's the message of Christ. Given, yes. Whenever you realize who has saved you, you love to hear those things. That's over right. Again. Amen. Amen. Yeah. And there's a lot in it, too, see? This is not just three fat, quick, fast points. In fact, the epistles, they open up the gospel. Mm -hmm. Christ died, you did too. Mm -hmm. Christ dies no more, you won't either. See, that Christ is dead to the world, as you are too. See, there's a lot to this death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. It's just not just that those three facts and that's it. Uh -huh. You preach these three. There isn't anybody you can't preach these facts to. Uh -huh. yes. Death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. But now the church gets it opened up because they're on the inside so they can have it opened up to them. Now, the means of redemption is, of course, consistently declared to be by the blood of Christ. We're redeemed by the blood of Christ. Ephesians 1.7 says, through his blood. Colossians 1.14 says it. Hebrews 9.12 says it. Revelation 5.9 says it. Redeemed by his blood. His blood is his life. His life was, he laid down his life and endured separation from God. Because that was the penalty for sin. The soul of sin, it shall die. That's right. That was the penalty. So that penalty had to be paid. Uh -huh. If you paid it, you couldn't recover from it. That would yeah. be the end of the matter. Jesus did die, but he didn't stay dead. Amen. <laughs> he came back from the dead, and his death paid, his blood paid the price. So you're just as free as you are sure that Jesus died and rose again. We have redemption through his blood. So you're not obligated to sin. You're not obligated to be in bondage. You're not debtors to the flesh to live after the flesh anymore. The debt's been paid. And I've heard people say, I know that God has forgiven me, but I haven't forgiven myself. I contend with them. They know they do not know that God has forgiven them. They've been taught to babble that, but that's the one thing they don't know. Because if you know God's forgiven you, you don't still retain the guilt. Your conscience is purged from dead work. So see, people are taught, this is psychobabble. See, this is psychology trying to teach people about what God has done for them. And God is gracious, God's forgiven you, but I haven't forgiven myself this is, uh, this, this is heresy. This is very serious, serious error. Because when, you, when, you're, when you've been redeemed from all iniquity and your conscience has been purged, you'll not be bothered with guilt. You'll acknowledge it. You'll say, I was. I was. I did it ignorantly in unbelief. But it will not drive you from God. It will not do it be the occasion to give thanks. We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Other versions read the forgiveness of our trespasses or the forgiveness, the forgiveness of sins. Our sins are forgiven. The forgiveness of offenses, the remission of sins. God forgives our failures the forgiveness of transgressions, forgave our sins, remission of our trespasses, took away all our sins. We have the forgiveness of sins, the forgiveness of our offenses, forgiveness of our shortcomings, the release of transgressions, the remission 
of deviations free of penalties and punishments chalked up by our misdeeds and the omission and the remission forgiveness of offenses shortcomings and trespasses now i read those to show that that's a big word Students of language found it very challenging to put into words what that word said. Forgiveness. We sounds simple, see, but it's not simple. Sins. Right here now, we're exposed to a teaching that's been virtually hidden from our generation. There's really not a lot of talk about sin. If, you, if you're able to pick up on it, there's not a lot of talk about sin or transgression or trespasses or offenses. See, there's not a lot of talk about it. It's more like mistakes, errors in judgment, things like that. Sins, very important. The word from which sins in this text is translated is not the ordinary word used for sin. The ordinary word, if you're a student of any form of Greek harmatia, that's the normal word for sin, which means missing the mark. <clears throat> like a man draws a bow and the arrow hits over there someplace, <laughs> not, not the target. Missing the mark, which is another way of saying vain living, pointless living. Your life wasn't in the right direction. You didn't accomplish what God meant you to accomplish. See, that sin means missing the mark. But that isn't the word that's used here. It's very, very interesting that it isn't. I give some text where it is. The word means, that used here means, sin means, sin as ordinary, it means to miss the mark, be mistaken, to miss or wander from the path of righteousness. You just not didn't end up where God wanted you. But that's not the word used here. Even though in a parallel statement that says the same thing, Colossians 1.14, he uses that, that harmatia word there, but he doesn't use it here. It's very interesting. It's just it's telling us that this is a very large concept. Here the word means offenses or trespass. In other words, the ordinary word for sin approaches it from the standpoint of where you end up. But this word deals with the nature of the sin itself, with the nature of sin. It's a, it's a trespass, means God said don't go here and you went there anyway. Huh? It's a transgression, God said don't do this, did it, he said do this, and it didn't. It's a transgression of God's law. The word sin presents the matter from the viewpoint, from our viewpoint. We transgressed, trespassed. The other word for sin views God's viewpoint. You aren't where I intended. Now, when you think about that, you think of people's lives whether you assess your own past life or you assess those around you, you know in yourself they're not where they should be. They're missing the mark. They're going in the wrong direction. That's the, big, that's the bigger word for sin. This here deals with the point by point is the idea here, see? Transgression point by point. In other words, every sin you committed was logged in the books. Logged there. They were offenses. Mm -hmm. And God was offended by it. Yeah. They were transgressions of the law. And it had an evil nature about it. It offends God when a person transgresses his law. Amen. Yeah, you don't want God offended. Go ahead. So you're saying through uh, trespasses and offenses, we missed the mark. That's right. That's the nature of this. He just puts the microscope on the sin and says, look here, this, there's a specific thing that's violated. The general word for sin says, look where you ended up over here. You ended up where I didn't want you, in the wilderness. <laughs> it's where, now I, said, I brought you out of Egypt to get you into the promised land, but here you are in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. Missed the mark. 
That's right. The trespass is the cause. The That's right. Is you're off That's the good. That's mm -hmm. good. These days, sinners are not often told how their lives are viewed by God. <laughs> I've actually heard sinners told, God loves you. I wouldn't, I'm not going to dispute whether God does or not. I'm just going to say that's not the message. Go ahead, hon. Uh, it's presented. Sometimes sounds as though there's room here for a difference of opinion between man and God. We're not, we're oh. not in that kind of a realm. That's it's, right. It's not Amen. like God has his way of looking at things. But then we have our way of looking at things. And it's not really fair for God to judge us for not... I mean, it's, it's really uh, startling. If you hear people talk, how that they, they have the audacity to question God, to judge God. They really do. They judge God. Now, anytime someone says God's not fair, or I don't see why... He would do that. They're judging God. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah. By by their standard, but this matter of sin. You talked about the nature and the end of it. The, the nature of sin is a corruption of what God made originally good. And corrupt uh, a corrupt nature begets corrupt works, and it bears corrupt fruit, mm -hmm. and it has a corrupt end. I think death actually is a picture of... That's right. I mean, whenever God yeah. said, The soul, in the day that you eat thereof, ye shall surely die. God had made them good. But whenever they disobeyed, they became corrupt in nature. Mm -hmm. And so corruption actually set in in a physical way. Yeah. Amen. As a, as a, uh, like the, the physical followed the spiritual. They became... what. Yeah, the amen. The effect of their spiritual corruption was seen in their flesh. Amen. As they as they deteriorated and then ultimately died. Amen. And of course we can see death as as separation and that that is the end of death in its final state if God doesn't intervene. We are so long as we are in sin, we are cut off from God. We are yes. dead in trespasses amen. and sin. Now, the fact that Paul uses this, this same expression, this Ephesians 1 7 is virtually verbatim quoted again in Colossians 1 14. But he uses this different word sin. But we are redeemed from the totality of sin. We are redeemed from being in the condition we were in, and we were redeemed from the guilt of the things that led us to that condition. See, it's it's a it's a big Thing. We've, been, we've been redeemed. All of that's been covered by the blood of Christ. Yes. So that you can make your way out of where you are and you're free from the guilt of what you were, what you did. Something to note about sin is that it spreads. Yes. If you allow one thing to, one little thing that may seem that it won't make a difference, it will. Because it, it grows, and it grows on you. Without this redemption that Jesus gave us, we would be engulfed in it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The little foxes, that's what yeah. mm -hmm. Yes, amen. You, amen. Can't have, you can't have redemption without both of those aspects. Amen. Mm -hmm. yeah. you, you can't carry your past guilt with you amen. and still be redeemed. It's mm -hmm. all got to be resolved. Uh -huh. Amen. Yeah, people say, you know, you mentioned this, that God loves you so much to a sinner. One thing that we can say for absolutely sure, Psalm 711, that God is angry with the wicked every day. Yeah. What it says. That's right. So it to tell them something that we're just theorizing on would not be wise. Yeah. yeah we, if we can bring a person to believe that, that what they've done and the way they've lived and where they're going is displeasing to God and nothing good for them can flow out of displeasure. Displeasure is not a fountain out of which goodness flows. That's right. Grace is, displeasure isn't. See? Amen. So this word has to got to be delivered. Yes. If forgiveness is real, mm -hmm. if it really is, it will have an impact on the one that's forgiven and knows they're forgiven. Mm -hmm. 
will have an impact upon them. You can go through life with a burden on your back, or you can go without it. Bearing Christ's burden, which is easy, and yoke is easy. We have redemption. So let's, people, let's, well, we don't do this, I understand, but let's encourage people not to continually talk about what they were and what they did and all this sort of thing, but to speak of who they are in Christ, what they have obtained, and if they don't know they've obtained it, preach it to them. Yes. We have redemption, even the forgiveness of sins. As I mentioned, some versions use the word remission or took away, release, free from. Forgiveness is a large word. When we say sit, forgiveness really doesn't mean took away. Some versions read took away. Took away, Jesus took away the sin of the world, not from you, mm -hmm. from God. Yes. That's what you've got to see. Mm -hmm. When Jesus took away the sin of the world, he took it away from God's sight. Mm -hmm. you're, you're, you will recall very vividly from time to time that you sinned. But God won't. <laughs> Praise his holy name. It was taken away from God. You were forgiven. Which has to do with your conscience. See, that's, a, that's just fun. The forgiveness fundamentally has to do with you. That's why Jesus leaned down to this man, let down from the roof, uh, laying on a pallet before he healed his son. Be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you. Amen. And I can tell you that if that registers with him, when Jesus said, take up your bed and walk, he was valiant enough to actually do it. The mark of the new covenant that he says, their sins and iniquities, <laughs> will I, will I, will yes, I, I remember. remember no more. Yeah. yeah, so the burden is for us to know that we have, this is all in, we have redemption. The forgiveness of sins. That's not the only thing that's in redemption, but that is one of the fundamental things because sin will keep you from serving God. Yeah. People may say, well, I just didn't feel like, you know, I didn't feel like it today. I just, well, it's not that simple. The, the blood of Christ can purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Yeah. Yes that you have this redemption can keep you from serving God too. Oh, yeah, that's mm -hmm. the point. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly the point. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's what the defiled conscience is not knowing. Uh -huh. yeah, amen. Uh -huh. that's right. that's and it's right. possible for you to be in Christ and have a defiled conscience. Uh -huh. That's why he said that to believers. The blood of Christ can purge your conscience. Heat back on you for one reason or another. They were in a backward stance. The Hebrew, for one reason, they were in a backward stance. So this, this tells you something that happens when a person starts going backward. And that thing I saw more clearly when he was talking about this, about Jesus laying down his life. I saw even clearer, you know, I thought about before, well, he laid down his fleshly body and his life. But no, he laid down his life that he had with God. I mean, he had a... A relationship with God where he had never had any sin and then That's he had right. the sin laid on him and he knew yeah. he knew what that was and so that was I can just well I can't imagine but I can just think on yeah. he made his, that was like he made his yeah. soul yes. an right. offering for yeah. sin Amen. Yeah. yeah he offered up that life uh -huh. Uh -huh. he had with God that's right mm -hmm. yeah serving God is something that has to be uh, in the energy of expectation and hope. Yeah, that's good. Amen. Even Jesus, for the joy set before him, endured the cross. So, like you said, there's these little excuses, I was tired or whatever. But it gets back to this fact that if a person's conscience isn't cleansed, yeah. they don't have the kind of hope that puts fervency and life into their service of God. Amen. Yeah. Now, I would say this, uh, lest I be misunderstood. I know there are times where we're not up to par physically. But when those times begin to be closer together and last longer, that's when you've got the jeopardy. You you can deal with those. So those so seasons come up on you when it's difficult to serve the Lord. You have to exert yourself. God doesn't can judge you because it was difficult. What he gives you, you have to engage sometimes in a little bit of war. Yeah. Now fight. Uh -huh. yeah. You have to fight uh -huh. to keep the faith. And if you do... That will not become a manner yes. of thinking Amen. in your life. Because he can give you time 
times are refreshing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I know from our experience that sometimes if you're physically tired and oh, physically yes. weary, uh -huh. it's easier for you to think in a stupid way. So it's good to be alert to that and fight against it. Yeah. This is where a lack of reading the scriptures and knowing yeah. the scriptures and spending time in the scriptures makes you weak. When you're spending time in the scriptures, you're reading the scriptures, you are strengthened for those times where you're going yeah. to be tempted. When temptation comes, and it will come, you'll have your armor on and you're more prepared to um, fight off at those times. Got and go run to Jesus. You got something in your bag. Amen. You know, the times where everything's going well, sometimes are the hardest times. Oh, yes. Yeah, you'll be tempted to let off That's a little right. bit. Now, this, let me be a little bit more further specific on the forgiveness. Forgiveness is a judicial act <coughs> of God through which the record of, of your offense is removed. Mm -hmm. In the from the books, That's right. it's a judicial. This is a right act, mm -hmm. and it's a judicial act of God, the Judge, mm -hmm. who has forgiven you. All one place says all trespasses. Yeah. He's forgiven us all yeah. trespasses. You're justified from all things mm -hmm. from which you could not be justified by the law of mercy. So it's all or nothing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. As used here, forgiveness of sins is a total, uh -huh. total view. It's not after this sin was confessed and so forth. Mm -hmm. It means that we're free from the dominating influence of Amen. sin. That's Amen. the announcement. See, the, we Amen. have redemption uh -huh. means you're not in bondage anymore. Mm -hmm. You're not dominated by sin Amen. anymore. Satan can't have his way with you anymore. Amen. Your conscience has been purged. See, this is, he announces it. This has got to be announced. The people of God have to be told this. Mm -hmm. Praise God. And then their faith reaches, yes, I, yeah. uh -huh. I see that, and they, I will arise and go to uh -huh. Jesus. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. yeah, yeah, it's like Barbara me. I'm throwing off my cloak and making my way with, believe though I'm blind, I, yes. I'll go by the sound of his voice, and I'll, I'll go to him. Yeah. Yes, amen. Free from the domination. There's an... And there's also an ongoing forgiveness that mm -hmm. takes place when you're in Christ. It's mentioned in 1 John 1, 7. Mm -hmm. The depth of which, well, I want to see more of it. If we walk in the light mm -hmm. as he is in the light, <coughs> we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Now, verse 9 mentions another scenario where if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. But here in verse 7, that's, that's before, verse 7 is before verse 9. <laughs> it's possible not to get in the situation of verse 9 Amen. as much as you think. Yes. Some people say, well, I say, I'll say, I, I'll just confess it. I'll go ahead and then I'll confess it. If we walk in the light as he's in the light, <coughs> He'll keep you clean. Yes. Why? Because you have redemption. Mm -hmm. Amen. So you have redemption. If you can see it, guilt is what pulls you back into sin. Mm -hmm. The backslider, one who goes back, goes back because of the plague of his former sins. Yes. If you have redemption, you keep in mind, I'm, I'm forgiven. I'm accepted. Mm -hmm. I'm in Christ Jesus. I'm cleansed. Mm -hmm. He'll keep you clean. Mm -hmm. But of course, that's that's the work that's laid out, <laughs> laid out before us. Mm -hmm. Then you reign in life, mm -hmm. yeah. rather than limping through it. <laughs> now, he's, of course, he's he doesn't let the sin of sins here. He's still in this one protracted sentence, from verse three through twelve. We have redemption, mm -hmm. the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Mm -hmm. And we'll now see why Paul written so precisely. Mm -hmm. Grace is perceived in the context of forgiveness, mm -hmm. not within the framework of continuing in sin. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You talk about grace, you say we're all sinners, but God has grace. Wrong, wrong way to say it. Mm -hmm. We're free from sin, therefore we have grace. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. We're free, we're, we're, we have redemption, According to mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
it was according to, yeah. in accordance with mm -hmm. the riches of his grace, through the riches of his grace, mm -hmm. this redemption accords with the riches of his grace. Mm -hmm. This redemption, even forgiveness of sins, is because of the riches of his grace. <laughs> See? Mm -hmm. that He traces it back to grace. Not to what you did, yeah. but to grace. Paul is accounting for us having redemption through Christ's blood. It isn't because we responded appropriately, even though that was that's necessary. It's according to the riches. It took a lot of grace even to accept you under those conditions. Even under the blood of Christ and redemption and so forth, it took a lot of grace to undo what, you, what was done. According to the riches, plentitude of his grace. Why did we receive such a glorious benefit as redemption and forgiveness? It's because God is gracious. That's why he's abundant in grace. Some might say, well, we received it because we called on his name. That's why we received it. Well, and what he's talking about here, he's, he's deeper than that. He's deeper than that. No, it's not because you called about his name. It's because he's rich in grace. Other people will say, well, it's because of my faith. Well, that in a sense that's true, but he's deeper than that. No, it's not because of your faith at this point here. It's because of the riches of his grace. He's going down to the rock bottom foundation here. Yeah. The big foundation. Some might say it's because I was baptized. That's why. I was baptized for the remission of sins. Well, that won't help you when you have doubts. When doubts plague you and you want to begin wondering, you'll think like this, maybe I wasn't baptized right. Maybe they didn't say the right thing. Maybe I didn't know enough. <laughs> but when you know you have redemption, you don't reason about your baptism that way. Amen. See? See the difference? Yeah. Because you're, it's just more of a foundation. See, remember that seed that fell in the soil that was shallow? There's a theology that's shallow like that, too. There's a theology that goes this deep, and then there's this rock of human reasoning, and it never gets, it never gets past that. It never gets down to this bigger rock underneath that is the riches of his grace. God's grace is so abundant, it actually overflowed. And we're getting the overflow. Amen. <laughs> He didn't, like, throw us in a bucket of grace. The idea is that the grace overflowed. Why did it overflow? Because once God was satisfied with the redemption price Jesus paid, his grace began to boil up yes, and to overflow on humanity. Right because now he was satisfied. Yes. Now the big work is to get us, <laughs> to get us satisfied. Salvation is traceable to the fact that God wanted to save us. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Because grace has to do with His yeah, will. Right. Yes. And according to the riches of His grace is the uh, motivation factor. Mm. It's oh, what actually yeah. motivated God. God found the reason to save, just like Brother Ricky said. He found the reason to save humanity in Himself, mm -hmm. not in humanity. Mm -hmm. where, where, where people, there is this danger of God. Because God loved you so much, He sent His Son. Mm -hmm. Well, that—that's one, one perspective. Is that you know, there? There was a love for humanity, but the problem with that is that it has—it has an emo that has an emotional impact on people. Mm. Be, convincing them to think it, because God loves me, or that He—he—he he, he responded to me in this way. But then the honest person knows that. There are other things that God sees in me as well. So how how are you going to be impacted by that? Your faith has to be grounded in what God does and who God is, not me. Amen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Think of this overflow in this way. Think of think of you're like a miniature world. Now think of Noah the world in Noah's day. God had to get rid of all the 
iniquity. And it said the, the earth being overflowed with water. <laughs> it destroyed all that. The earth was, in fact, washed. All right, that's what grace does. Grace is, it, is the overflow of God's favor and goodness that washes the effects of sin away. Amen. Abundant grace. See, the, when he says the forgiveness of sins, the effect of sin is included there. What sin caused, that's removed too. And you're liberated in Christ Jesus. Oh, it's more of the riches of his grace. Some versions uh, translate it the wealth of his grace, or the overflowing of his grace, abundance, the generosity. In other words, this is another one of those big words that there isn't a simple English word to talk about it. The idea is it's always, no matter how close in you get, it's always big. <laughs> There's always a lot of grace. No matter if you're on the inside or you're approaching, you're impressed. Matter of fact, the closer you get, the more you're impressed with its largeness, yeah. the abundance of it, the abundance, the riches yeah. of his grace, of his favor. And it's, it's his grace. Yeah. Now this phrase, his grace, is used several times. It's, it's a domain. It's, now think of his grace as it's a domain in which things happen, that God wants to happen that can't happen anywhere else. Redemption is one of those things. Adoption is another one of those things. Choosing is another one of those things. <laughs> and eternal inheritance is another one of those things. It's all in this domain of grace where God's doing this because he wants to do it and he prefers you, and he wants to do it to you. Not something we, you hope you get in a situation where I can. This is in Christ. You are in a situation Amen. where he can. Me of Jesus. The day of his resurrection, many holy people mm -hmm. came out of the graves. That's right. Amen. That's right. It wasn't right. due to anything they had done. No. It was the Over holy people. Of the power of his resurrection. Yeah. Power yeah. Of Went in the city and testified to some, yes. Yeah, but given you're talking about the riches, and it made me think, if you got a letter from Bill Gates and he said, go out and pick out a car, and I, whatever one you pick up, and you go out and you drive by the used car lot and wonder, I wonder if he can afford one of these. Yeah. Yeah, how foolish that would be. Yeah. The, 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 he can afford any, any, there's not even made one made that he couldn't afford. Right. And there are so many believers in Christ that are doing this very thing. I, I wonder if he can help me. Well, yeah. <laughs> Amen. <clears throat> The expression, his grace, is found eight times in Scripture. There's the word of his grace. That's an expression of it. There's that we are justified freely by his grace. We have redemption by his grace. In the ages to come, God will show the exceeding riches of his grace. We are justified by his grace. To his grace, this is a big, big thing. He told Moses, I'm full of goodness. That's grace, see, is what that is. It's just a, it's a miniature view of grace. But great, if God can ever set his favor on somebody, there isn't anything he can't do yes, for them. Yeah. So what is, he knows that you can't achieve a favorable status yourself we know that it, you'll never be able to say well at last praise God I've arrived I'm not going to have to work at this anymore so what he did he had to put you uh -huh. Uh -huh. in a favorable place so he put you in Christ Jesus in the heavenly places and now his favor just, just as a starter he justified you by his grace which handled all the negative stuff was all handled. There it was. Amen. And you're all licensed and qualified to come to God. Amen. <laughs> Justified by his grace. Grace has to do, as I said, with God's favor, preference, esteem, 
approval. There's things you like to see. There's things God likes to see, too. He knows that he told people under the law what they could do to get in that position, right? He told them this do and live. He told them, but, they, but after 1,500 years, the people finally concluded they were going to have to have some help on this. So God said, well, here's what I'll do. I got to kill you first. You got to die first. When you die, and then you got to die with my son. You can't just die. That's not it. You got to die with Christ. I'll raise you from the dead, and then I'll put you over here where I just, my, uh, you, you see my smiling face all the time. And because I want to do this, I'll do it. Now the only limit is going to be your capacity. And you can grow in that. I can enlarge your heart, increase your fruits of righteousness. So you're in a station place here where you can grow and advance. And the, the more you grow, the more I'm attracted to you. The more I'm attracted to you, the more I pour out on you. Amen. And the beginning is justified by his grace. Yeah. <laughs> Even the forgiveness of sins. So it has to do with, grace has to do with what we receive, not with what we don't receive. See, grace isn't you're not damned. By the grace of God, I'm not what I was. No. By the grace of God, I am what I am. See, there's a, there's a difference, brethren. But there's, a, there's this thinking that I think it's a natural way of thinking, but people say, oh, by the grace of God, at least I'm not back there anymore. No. Is by the grace of God you are where you are in Christ. Grace has to do with where you are, not where you aren't. Mercy has to do with where you aren't. It's a big, uh, big step. It is by Jesus Christ, according to the riches of his grace, it's by Jesus Christ that we come to have access by faith into this grace. That overflows. It's, in a, it's in now in an overflowing status. In Christ Jesus, God's grace is overflowing. It's like a waterfall. It's like a waterfall. There's waterfalls been of hundreds of years. Been falling water. Water's been falling there. It's been, it's been, there's a big source out there. You'll find there's, been, there's some river that's fed by an ocean or something. See, there's a big source. That's how it is with God's grace. It's overflowing like a waterfall, abundant of it because of the source back here is never depleted. It's never depleted. See, he's preparing, you can see he's preparing the Ephesians to act upon his exhortations. Now let him that stole steal no more. <laughs> they can see this, what he's saying, they'll just, they'll just stop. Put on the new man. Put off the old man. He's going, to tell, he's going to tell him to do this. Put off the old man. Put on the new man. Well, once you, once you see this, we've been talking about here tonight, then you're able to do that. Grace will enable you to do it. He's going to say, put on the whole armor of God so you can stand in the evil day. Once you see this, you're justified by his grace. You put it on and you stand. But if you don't, spiritual life was just designed this way. That if you're ignorant of the resources, you just start, you're, you become impotent. Yes, that's, right. Amen. that's how it is. If it wasn't that way, nobody would ever call on the name of the Lord. <laughs> they never see grace to help at the time of need. But they, but they do. So you can see the, the importance of this, uh, of this truth. Tony. Talk about grace all day. But until you connect it to its source. That's right. <laughs> not really a benefit for That's you. That's right. I think I think there's a lot of ignorance about God's grace. That's somebody to tell you sometime, what are your thoughts about the grace of God? What have you thought about the grace of God? What, what is it? What is it? What are your thoughts about that? Just let them talk. Don't interrupt them. Just let them talk. I can pretty well guarantee you most people won't talk long. But the more you know about it, the more you talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, picture you gave us about the flood and removing sin and how that, that um, 
I wrote down here, the flood was a shadow of God's grace. That's right. You say saved by grace. <laughs> washed it. Yeah. Got washed Amen. everything away except what God had saved. Amen. Right? That's the same way that his, his redemption removes everything that's not saved. <laughs> yes, Brother Bob. Some, some are, would be content to just um, make a, a profession at one time or or they may even say, or we're willing to die one time. But when they find out that you have to die every Daily, day. Daily, yeah. You know, this, now it just becomes hard. It becomes yeah. more involved than what they were willing to really yeah. submit I to. I know. I know what you mean. In the beginning. And, and yet, if it's told them right from the beginning, that you got to die. You can't, from now until yeah. the day you, you, you go to, to be with the Lord, you are not the point now. Christ is the point. Glorifying God's yeah. the point. Believe in this. This is a full-time job, so to speak. <laughs> Amen. And unless it's done that way, you won't have the gas. <laughs> You'll run out. Amen. Yes, Brother Judah? You know, our mission of sins was something that we had to have before we were able to be accepted by God. We had, we had to have it because we, could, we couldn't be accepted defiled before God. He won't accept something that's not like him. Amen. Yes. As you're talking about this, a, a large picture is looming. We know that this, this was all designed according to the uh, purpose and foreknowledge of God. He actually created the things that now are with this in mind. Mm. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that and salvation was a work that, that would... Uh, this was a quality of God that that couldn't just be talked about. It had to be demonstrated oh, good. in yeah. order for for it to be properly understood. So grace is that superior provision uh, and operation of God which allows for a more excellent manifestation of himself. Amen. Yeah, well said. Amen. Mm -hmm. Read say that again. I wrote it down. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. Say it again. It's good. This grace is that superior provision and operation of God, which allows for the more excellent manifestation of himself. Amen. Good. Amen. Good. <laughs> Anyone else tonight? Yes, Brother Ricky? To go along with that, and as you were talking about the overflow, I was thinking, you know, for thousands of years prior to the redemption of Christ, God had wanted to be yes, right. gracious. Mm -hmm. Remember, he revealed himself to Moses as being abundant and goodness and truth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But he was restrained because there wasn't a right reason to do it. Mm -hmm. But see, the redemption that's in Christ has, so to speak, loosed God, can we say it that way? Yeah. To be able to do exactly what he wants to do now. And that's what makes his person know. Amen. Is when he's not restrained. Amen. To do it righteously, you know. Yeah, that's right. That's because God is righteous. See, that's that's why He couldn't do it before, because it'd been unrighteous. Uh, it really, it really could apply His grace on anyone who wasn't like Himself. That's okay. right. So, that's it's right. It's remarkable. I, I can't, I can't help from, I can never get away from that thought that God is the only one that can look in the mirror. Mm -hmm. You know, it be, it can be totally pleased with what that's He That's right. Says. Amen. It all goes back to Him. You yeah. see. The we best, gotta be like him. The best we can see is a reflection, yeah. and the reflection is Christ. Amen. And then we become a sort of a miniature yeah. reflection. Yeah. Men will actually get in the way if they diagnose people differently than God does. Yeah. Amen. And especially if they announce it. Yeah. If they say, Well, but that's all right, God understands it. How in the world could you prove it? And now you've complicated the situation. Yeah. Now you've stabbed the person's conscience. The very thing that God gave them to, to alert them, there's a problem. And now you've told, you put a little salve on it and said, that's okay. Amen. Now, if they do come to the truth, they're going to have to do it. Uh, they're going to have to actually avoid or get over what you said to them. Amen. When you think of sin missing the mark, you think of Paul. It, he wasn't, he wasn't condemned because he was zealous toward God it was because he was headed the wrong direction <laughs> he, you see his zeal was missed the mark yeah, uh -huh, yeah, yeah. 
And he ended up persecuting the church of God. See, that's why sin's missing the mark. Even though on the, to appearance, it may look really good uh -huh, uh -huh. and beneficial and helpful, but it's, it's going to miss, miss the mark God intended. Yes. Amen. All right, we'll have a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we are grateful and praise you for your magnificent grace and its abundance. We thank you, Holy Father, for the redemption that's in Christ Jesus, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of your grace. We love you because you first loved us, and we consider your grace the most precious commodity. Thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.